Welcome to On the Edge. I'm your host, Matthew Wexler, and you're watching Edge Media Network, your go-to spot for LGBTQ news and entertainment. On the Edge welcomes movers, shakers, tastemakers from the LGBTQ community and our allies. And today I am super excited, dare I say hungry, to have our guest with us today, Kristen Kish. If you're a foodie, you will know Kristen Kish won season 10 of Top Chef. She is a cookbook author, a restaurateur, television personality, and now Kristen is co-hosting a brand new show on True TV called Fast Foodies. Let's take a look. Coming to True TV, experience a gourmet twist on fast food. Bring out my dish! We're gonna take our favorite fast food items, we're gonna copycat them, and then we get to remix it and put our own little spin on it. My dish is gonna be a gooey cheese fritter with shaved Wagyu beef. My mouth is like, what? <laughs> I'm making prosciutto with pineapple relish. It's so delicious. It's like space alien food. <laughs> when I looked at it, I thought, no way that this is a spicy chicken sandwich. <laughs> and yet it is. <laughs> You've never seen a cooking competition show? No! Like this. Yeah. All right, who wants a drink? Mm -mm -mm. We're gonna go purge ourselves or something. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Screw you, burgers. <laughs> Say hello to my little friend. Can you do your best horror movie screen? Yeah. Ah. Ah. Oh my gosh, somebody wants attention. <laughs> Fast Foodies, new series premieres February 4th on True TV. Oh my gosh, it's really so much fun. I have to admit, I uh, binge watched uh, Fast Foodies all weekend, and then I went out past my bedtime and got Taco Bell. So guilty as charged. Let's bring on Kristen Kish. Hey, hey, Kristen. How Hi, are you? Good morning to you. I'm good. good. I'm good. I'm hungry now. How are you? <laughs> yeah, both. Same. <laughs> I'm awesome. always hungry. It's my first question, actually. I think the, the first and foremost thing that I always want to know from people, uh, especially from the culinary world, is if they're a breakfast person or not. You know what? I'm not. Um, it's not because I'm not hungry. Um, sometimes it, it, I am a little hungry, but for me, when I go into my work day of being surrounded by food all the time, I have to be slightly hungry because otherwise it's like, think of like Thanksgiving or when you cook a big dinner for your friends after you're done right. cooking, like you're like, okay, I'm kind of over it now. And so for me, that's exactly how, you know, what I have to do because it is my job. So I have to be a little hungry. So everything seems slightly more appetizing. <laughs> it's your motivator. I totally yeah. get it. I totally get it. Um, the show is so much fun. Um, the latest venture for you. I'm curious, did this shoot over the past year do in, during crazy COVID? What was your uh, experience like? Okay. Yeah, it did. And it was uh, the summer. I think it was like June or July, something um, in Los Angeles. And it was my very first flight that I took um, coming out of, you know, quarantine basically but I mean everything was great I, you know there's so many rules and regulations in the TV world that you know we all have to that we all have to follow so it never felt different especially when you started filming and shooting so as soon as that camera turned on like it was any other day yeah yeah it's so much fun to watch I'm curious sort of like how the gig came to uh, fruition for you obviously you have experience um, the intersection of food and TV from Top Chef, and then you did the Travel Channel show with 36 Hours, but True TV is sort of like a entity unto itself. So I'm curious sort of like how this, how this came about, especially um, with your co-hosts as well. So the way TV kind of works or from my experience is that someone, a manager will reach out because someone reached out to them and how it actually gets to me. I don't really fully know the entire journey, um, but essentially it came to me and it got to the place where, you know, I was on Zoom with casting and, you know, the executive producer, Michael Rucker, who just happens to also work on Top Chef and we know the same people. And it's just kind of, it, you know, it's all one big happy family, I guess. And, you know, a lot of people in other networks doing other things and whatever. So um once someone, I guess, I, I don't know how I got brought into this or what made people think that I was a good fit right. for it. I think maybe it's just because I've been very open about my love of fast food. So uh, oh, perhaps cool. that all kind of bridged the gap. Did you know, um, I know Jeremy Ford and Justin Sutherland, those are your co-hosts on the show. They also are sort of top chef alum, um, different seasons. Did you know them before? Or did you Did your work kind of intersect with them or was this the first time you had connected with them? 
So I had worked with Jeremy um, once or twice before. So I had met him in person. Justin and I had never met. But when you are part of the Top Chef family, like we all have like this commonality and this common ground that not a lot of people have had the same experience as us. So, you know, it's like when, even if you've never spoken to someone um, that's been on the show, but the second you meet them or the second you actually have some form of interaction, it's like, oh, hey friend. Like it's just, it is, that's exactly what it is. It's a small little club that we belong, um, that we belong to. Yeah, yeah. So I'd love um, for you to share for those of uh, our viewers who haven't seen it yet, just sort of the, concept behind the show here. We have a couple photos of you in the kitchen uh, working your magic. Um, so the show, each episode has a guest star um, and then there's two rounds and then some damage that happens to them. Right. We'll get to that in a little while. So what are, what are the two rounds and the differences between the two of them? Yeah, so the celebrity guest comes in, they bring us their favorite fast food item. So literally right from drive through onto the table, we all get to try it. And so the first round is us trying to recreate it exactly like copycat it to a T um, exactly how this fast food restaurant makes it. Um, and then yeah. from there, whoever wins that will go into the remix round, which is where we basically can do our own chef spins. Like there's no rules really. It's kind of like whatever we can dream and actually physically make like anything is possible. Um, so we go into that round, but the, the two losers who lost the copycat round, um, are faced with a disadvantage, like a fun little game, you know, whether you tie your hands together or you can only use one hand or, you know, you can't use the stove until you find the knobs, that kind of, you know, fun kitchen hazing, I guess. Um, right, right. And then the celebrity guest will choose their favorite remix and that person will ultimately go home with what we call the championship trophy. Fun. Which is this massive like gold spray painted. I wish I had a photo of that because it's ridiculous, right? It's it should pretty not great. belong in anybody's home. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to win it and then you kind of like give it back. <laughs> right. Perfect. Uh, so I've noticed, as I mentioned, I did completely binge watch the entire season that's available thus far on True TV, um, which was so much fun. And even watching the clip, I just kind of had the smile on my face. Um, because it's like this great balance of real culinary technique mm. and sort of this true TV aesthetic. Were you kind of aware, my producer loves impractical jokers on true TV mm. and it makes me so uncomfortable, but yet I watch it. Um, <laughs> did you kind of know what you were getting in for in terms of the antics, I guess? Maybe that's the best way to put it, right? You know, I mean, I don't think anyone really fully understood what the show, the final, you know, 24 minutes and 30 seconds or whatever we're going to mm -hmm. actually look like. Um, but when you go into a show and kind of the rule is basically like have fun and be yourself and cook great food, like you kind of know that anything's going to go. And the idea of fast food while also being able to like be real chefs during this process as well. And then you layer in this aspect that I think the three of us perhaps never really have truly felt before, which is literally just have fun. Like we're not competing for a huge prize check. We're not competing for, you know, our reputation. And if we lose, then, you know, we're gonna fall off the culinary world or something. Um, we literally get just, a, you know, competition is folded into it as very friendly, as something that is naturally um, in us as chefs, and then it gives you somebody to root for, you know, each episode. So it's it's friendly competition with very low stakes is what we like to say. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's very joyful. Um, I will say, if we want to break it down sort of round by round, there there is a little bit of, um, I want to say sort of like, like technique tension in the yeah. in the first round because you're imitating food that is typically prepared not typically always in mass production right and so i've seen each of you in different episodes or different moments struggle with like trying to be true to the essence of what the product is and not elevate it yeah that makes sense yeah, i mean that's hard by by nature we're going to rely heavily on our instinct to cook um, as much as it is skill a lot of it's just like learned instinct um, and then we also have somewhat better ingredients to choose from so you know we there's some days where you want to play a little heavier into it where i made purposefully awful french fries because in and out fries i, I will say a hundred times over are awful um right. and then you have the days where you like you can't help yourself and it's almost like you don't really fully understand what you're going to make or what's going to happen until you go to serve it. Like, so it's, who knows? It's anyone's guess at that point. 
Yeah. And then when you think about the second round, which is sort of a free for all, you're finding inspiration in the fast food and really sort of like flipping it in any direction that you want. How much time? I mean, I know Top Chef is like, like you're all sort of working on the fly. Do you have, did you have a little more time in this production uh, capsule to sort of think about how you were going to reimagine the food or is it the same thing that's like, oh, that day, what am I going to make? No, no, we do have a little bit more time, like 24 to 48 hours, probably. It, it's it's not, there's not like this hard set rule that we're going to know 24 hours before. Um, but typically, you know, they need to know our culinary culinary department needs to know ahead of time so they can prepare and actually have the ingredients that we need. Um, so, you know, I, I'd say average 36 hours ish. Yeah. So you, you have yeah. a minute, but also too, like, you know, I don't know about the, about the guys, but for me coming up with a, a point of inspiration is a natural process. So when I develop recipes and dishes for my restaurant, it's like, okay, well, something's going to strike and I'm going to write it down. Um, it's very rare that someone's like, here, here's this, now give me inspiration. And I'm like, wait, what? And so sometimes it was a little bit more difficult. Um, there are some episodes where I went into the day thinking I knew what I was going to make. And then when I got there, it, it turned into something else just because, you know, I was having more fun or I accidentally drank a little too much whiskey. I don't know. Um, so, yeah. I, the thing about True TV, it's like you're all boozing and F-bombs are dropping everywhere. I'm like, I want to be in that kitchen. Yeah, it it's a like good time. I think we yeah. all we all had a chance to let loose. And honestly, I will truthfully say that when you can just relax in that sense as a chef, sometimes food comes out a lot better um, because it doesn't have like this this idea that it needs to be perfect. Right, right. So the other wild card uh, component, I think of this are all the amazing um, guest stars that you have, you know, that sort of come in and judges. Um, I don't want to ask you who your favorite is, although I know there was a certain special guest that we'll get to momentarily. But of all the um, talent that came in, was there anyone that sort of surprised you with their culinary perspective or their ability to sort of taste and articulate sort of describe the connection of the food to the fast food mm -hmm. version or your reimagined version that you thought, oh, wow, this person could do like food writing on the side. <laughs> you know what? I think who, someone that really surprised me, oh, not because I didn't think that they knew about food, but it's um, when you have someone like James Vanderbeek on, who is like, you know, your teen heartthrob. Yes, there he is. I mean, look it. at him. What, what a charming guy. Um, and he's like very... He's very calm, he's subdued, but he was very subtle in the way he approached coming onto the show. Um, but in between all those subtleties came in the humor that just was like, kind of like slid right in there. And then all of a sudden he'd say something about food where you're like, oh wow, wait, what did you just say? So it kind of caught you off guard as opposed to perhaps some of our other guests that come on and just like spew information. Um, right. his, his had a more subtle approach, which if you listened carefully, especially in, you know, obviously we film for 10 hours a day and you only see 24 minutes, but um, throughout the course of the day, there were little hints where I was like, oh wow, like I wanna know more. Yeah, he's really captivating on camera. And I can say um, whether you're part of the LGBTQ community, like however you identify, whatever your gender is, like we can all have a crush on James Vanderbeek. <laughs> totally allowed, right? hundred percent. Yes, I told my fiance, a beautiful woman that I, you know, my, my little heart pitter pattered when I saw him. <laughs> Yeah, he was super sweet. Um, There's someone else who I really liked, and we have a photo of you with uh, Amanda Seals. Yes. Um, here, uh, one of our uh, viewers asked, what was it like to have Amanda on the show? I mean, hold, like, first of all, when you get to meet someone that is so strong in their conviction, that is so sure of themselves, that is so smart in so many different arenas, it's intimidating, but in a really good way. And so that's what Amanda was. She's not only fun and charming and funny, but she also had a way of conveying important messages through the course of the day. Um, and also then just, you know, noshing on Taco Bell. So it's kind of yeah. like everything that you want in a human, you get. Yeah. That was the, I think that was the episode that inspired me most. Like I said, I went out and um, <laughs> got Taco Bell after watching it. Because there was such, like you guys spend so much time talking about the, like the texture of the meat. Yes. That I never, I mean, Taco Bell is usually what you eat at 3 a.m. after you've been out all night. But I went not under those circumstances. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, they're kind of right. It has yeah. this strange um, sort of texture to it. 
Yes. I mean, some of the fast food that we had during all of the, I've had, I think I had all of them at one point in my life, but a lot of them, like you were saying, was like the 3 a.m. after a few drinks. So being able to eat it and like really have to think about it in a sober mind and not at 3 a.m., like, you know, you picked up a lot of different um, different touches that fast food has. Yeah, yeah. Ron Funches, who's a hilarious comedian mm -hmm. and um, a voiceover artist. So for that episode, you were recreating a crispy chicken sandwich. Um, from Wendy's, from yeah. Wendy's, right? Yeah. And I thought it was interesting that he's like how he remembered it and how it actually tastes are yeah. like, two different things, right? I mean, honestly, when when that chicken sandwich showed up and we unwrapped it, I was like, wait a second. And maybe it's because the visuals on like commercials and advertising and marketing make it look, make it look perhaps larger and bigger in all senses of the, of the word, you know, right. it, it, it looks better. Um, and so when we reopened it, I was like, why is it, it's literally the size of my palm. And I was like, wait, right. I thought there were like pieces that were, you know, like beautiful and crispy and like pieces of batter that was, you know, jagged yeah. edges and all. No, like Wiener Schnitzel or something. No, yeah, it, was just it wasn't like, like that. Like it's sat on. <laughs> yes, but it was act. It, but it was good. <laughs> and that's right. the beauty of fast food. Whether you understand or know what we're cooking in the remix round, um, you know, or even whether you've had a Wendy's chicken sandwich or not, you've certainly had some form of fast food chicken sandwich in some sense of the word. Um, and so being able to immediately have a common ground with all different kinds of people from all over the place. Um, it, you know, it, it sets us on an even playing field to be able to talk about food and then for people to understand. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. I don't know if it was that episode or another, I, I think it came up a couple, a couple times. So your co-host Justin Sutherland, like has this thing about mayonnaise. Yeah. Like we'll not eat mayonnaise, right? I call that the Guy Fieri syndrome because Guy like famously doesn't eat eggs, which <laughs> is insane to me. I don't know. I can't pick on Justin because he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> but like how a chef We, are, does, we picked like, on him. It's fine. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. So you have my back. Is there anything that you won't eat or that you really try to avoid like an ingredient? I mean, mm. what's that stinky fruit? Like that super stinky durian. fruit? Durian. Yeah, it's not like durian, it's mayonnaise, right? Right. Um, is there anything that you avoid in the kitchen? Okay, so first of all, I love mayonnaise. I, I. love like creamy, tangy, emulsified sauces. I, I think it's delicious. Nice. Um, I actually will not physically eat, and I, I, at this point, I've tried a couple of times, I will not physically like put it in my mouth because it will make me gag. Um, something that so many people like, and that is smoked salmon. So out of all the things in the food world, smoked salmon is one food that I will not eat. You've left me silent. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's such I'm a thinking, random thing. Yeah. Is it is it um, like gravlax or is it like if you Both. had like a so it's not a textural thing. It's like no, the, it's 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 and it's not even a smoked or cured fish thing. It's a smoked or and or cured salmon. Salmon. I do, I'm not a big salmon person. I can I can I can get down sometimes if I I'm at a omakase restaurant and you know right. the sushi chef gives me this beautiful piece of salmon belly on a gorgeous piece of seasoned rice or something. I'll eat it um, and somewhat enjoy it. Smoked salmon. I don't know what it is. It's it's the way the oil stays on my lips. It's the way the smoked salmon just stays in my olfactory glands. It is the way the the salmon fat on top of the salmon. I don't know. I could I could get I could literally probably write a five page essay on why okay. I don't like it. All right. <laughs> well I I promise never to send you a gift basket from Russ and Daughters in New Thank York you. City. Yes. <laughs> I will happily eat the caviar, the creme fraiche, the bagels, the, the crossing vodka. off my list right now. <laughs> Done. Um I'd love to hear a little bit more about your uh I mean, it's so amazing to see where you are now, but a little more about your background and training at the Court of Blue in Chicago and sort of what got you to this point. You had a great mentor uh, with Barbara Lynch. Mm -hmm. um, curious how she impacted your career, um, not just from a food standpoint, but like a bigger sort of mentorship yeah. perspective. You know, I so I started going to college for international business and economics, and I realized that first year I was also very much um, not out at that time as well. So I was struggling with my sexuality. I was struggling with this idea of traditional life and and creating and forging a path for me that looked like 
everyone else and what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and then after a year of that, I realized I was horribly depressed. I really was terrible at, at international business and economics and nearly failing out of school. Um, and my mother of all people was like, why don't you try culinary school? You really like watching cooking shows. And I was like, okay. So I went, um, I, I went through the two year program, uh, graduated, had a whole slew of other you know, issues of trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted to do. Um, and then, you know, sped, speed it up many, many years. And then I meet Barbara. And what Barbara really did for me is, I mean, she'll say it herself. She was like, I never taught you how to cook, but I taught you to find confidence in who you are in order to be a great chef. So until you understand who you are um, at the core of your personality and the core of your being, it's really hard to tell your story through food. Um, you can be a great cook because you can cook with your brain and, you know, cook in that sense. But um, what she really taught me was um, that it was okay to be myself. Yeah, yeah. And it shows up in your book as well. We have a slide that I want to put up um, of a quote from your cookbook. Mm. Let's take a look at that momentarily. Here we go. It says, when you are able to live your life as who you are and not half truths, every aspect, including your career, will have more room to flourish. So yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, because what happens when you when you find a path that you think you're supposed to go on, you're so I for me personally, I was so I was so engulfed in keeping it on this on this path that I just couldn't see anything else in every beautiful opportunity and gorgeous like thing to explore about who I was and what the world had to offer me. I, I was blind to all of those. Um, and so as soon as I took those blinders off, uh, that was like, I mean, night and day. Yeah, I've got your book right here. Thank it's you. So awesome, I've been flipping <laughs> through. Um, one of the things that I love is that each of the recipes um, sort of reminds you of what the technique is, blanching, sweating, um, you know, searing, um, it's just frying. So it just sort of reinforces like the tech, the core techniques that sort of just make us better better in the kitchen. Well, and it's also, um, as I was going through the book and we were writing the recipes, I was using the terminology of like blanche and saute, brunoise, you know, sweat, I don't know, braise, all these different things. And then it, it's, it was kind of like, oh, well, this is what the core of the book should be because it's like learning how to walk before you can run and learning your ABCs before you can start writing papers, um, learning how to count to 10 before you can start to multiply. Oh, it's it's understanding the 101s and the basics that in life in general that really can help um, carry on this like level of education in a lot of ways. So I tried to do that and the technique and then also marry it with a lot of personal notes of point of inspiration, which is much of it comes from my childhood and growing up in Michigan. Right, right. Um, I'm curious, you touched on this a little bit in terms of um, coming out and identifying as part of the LGBTQ community, like how that translated into your confidence in the in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. We think of our sort of like heritage and cultural influences, whether it's growing up in Michigan or other identif things that we identify with. But um, I don't know, connecting it to our queer culture might be a little um, more interesting, I think, for people to think about how those mm -hmm. two things. You know, so, long before I kind of came out and really accepted who I was, even after I came out, I still had to learn what it was to me. Um, and that was the also kind of a part of that exploring who you are and getting real comfortable with who you are so you can convey what you want to convey through food. And I think it's just all a confidence thing. So I'm not saying you come out and all of a sudden you have this like armor of confidence. It's you come out and at least it gives you permission to start tiptoeing and understanding a little bit more of who you are, where you come from, why you think the way you think. And so for me, being able to come out one lifted, lifted a weight off my shoulder, broaden the horizon out where then I could fill it with all these other experiences while not having to worry about, um, you know, being in the closet or, you know, trying to figure out who I was and hiding some part of me. And so really what it did is, is it just opened up my world um, where I was more confident to, you know, talk to people, explore food in a different way, travel, um, you know, walk, walk through this world 
a little bit higher so then I could kind of see above the bushes. Mm, that's so great. I, um, before we let you go, I have been seriously contemplating like what my fast food is if I was you know, <laughs> able to be invited into the fast food kitchen. Um, I had several choices, but I did narrow it down. So I wanna just throw this at you mm -hmm. and I would love to hear how you might reimagine this. So we have a slide. This is the halal guys. Yaro and chicken here in New York City, which started as a street cart. Now, mm. I don't know, I think you can order it online or uh, get it in Las Vegas, which is, you know, ridiculous to me. I think like <laughs> you have to go to the original spot over by Rockefeller Center and wait in line with a hundred people yes. in order to truly appreciate it. Um, so how might, how might you flip that? So I've, I've had versions of this. I've had Halal Guys specifically. And so again, a lot of times the point of inspiration will come off of like something more recent. So for me, when I eat, when I eat that tin foil of food, I live in the world where I like to mix all my food together, use a spoon and shovel it in as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. I think if food is packed together in one container, it is meant to be consumed even more mashed up together. And so for me, the way I approach um, this specific dish is I mix it all together, I eat it, the yogurt and the hot sauce together are like the key point in this. And so when I think of spoon and rice, my brain then goes to kanji. When I think of kanji, I think of Japanese, but this isn't Japanese, right? So let's then take beautiful, like rich bone marrow, spices, all the things, oregano, the lemon, the garlic, turmeric, coriander, all the things you find seasoned on the halal guy's meat and put that into a, a kanji soup warming broth, right? Something we can eat with our, with our spoon. And because a lot of times we approach the copycat again, quite literally where we have the actual meat itself, going into a remix round, I like to remove the, the meat portion in some time, in a lot of ways, because I'm like, well, we just had an afternoon of eating fried chicken. Um, and so what I like to do probably for this is mushrooms that you like infuse with so much flavor, You nice little batter, fry, crispy things, because we all need texture, load them on top of the kanji, Lots of beautiful watercress for peppery stuff, you know, a little bit of creme fraiche to fold into it and get to town with a spoon. <laughs> wow, it sounds delicious. Uh, you have me hungry. Um, <laughs> the world is starting to reopen, thankfully, right? And I'm curious, um, as, a, as a final parting thought, where it is that you want to eat first, if it's a particular dish or a particular restaurant or a particular chef that's sort of on the top of your list of, oh, I've been waiting a year to get out of my apartment and eat this, what might that be? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm going to give you two answers. One is a little sure. bit of a shameless plug only because it's an actually, I actually really love it. So my restaurant in Austin called Arlo Gray, we were closed mm -hmm. for eight months. And so I was just itching to get back into the kitchen, itching to create a menu with my chef and my team and eat the food, try it as a team, you know, brainstorm and talk about food and be in, be in it again. Um, so in that sense, I'd have to say Arlo Gray. Um, and the other side of the, the spectrum, you know, I don't know, I, that's a hard question because there's so many right? There's so many friends that I want to see. There's so many restaurants, there's so much food. Um, but I will say during quarantine, the thing I was craving the most um, that is kind of odd for me uh, were donuts. Mm. So yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so maybe donuts, every donut place known on this planet. Right. Maybe season two of Fast Foodies, you need to get some donuts in there unless you've done I, donuts and I just haven't seen that. Before. No, we've only done savory. So, you know, Knock on wood for a season two, let's throw some dessert challenges in there. Right, right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was so great chatting with you this morning. I'm so excited about the show and to hear more about your background and what you're doing on Fast Foodies. Um, I hope we can share a meal together soon. Definitely, I will cook you that meal I just spoke to you about for Halal Guys. When we can meet I'm in person, hold you to that. I, I will cook it for you because actually talking about it made me want it. So uh, right. thank you so much. All right, thank you, Kristen. Okay. And there you have it. Um, if you wanna check out Fast Foodies, tune in to True TV on Thursday nights at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard to find out what Kristen and her cohorts are cooking up. And until next time, live on the edge. <laughs>